I've been sober for over 11 and a half years. But here's the real big news, I didn't drink today. This is my story. I should mention, just to put this into its fullest context, that I'm 73 years old today. And I just wanted you to know how long it's been since I was growing up, so back in the 50s. There was no alcohol in my house when I was growing up. My parents weren't teetotalers. They just didn't drink. And it wasn't an issue. There was, there was nothing really happening that made me think that they should be drinking. There just wasn't any alcohol around. In fact, I can only remember two occasions that my parents had a drink. It was so unusual that I actually remember this. One time, we were at an Italian restaurant, and they had a glass of wine with the meal. It's the only time I ever saw that happen. Another time, when I was a Cub Scout, my dad took me on a weekend camping trip with the pack, and there was beer available for the grown-ups, and he had a beer. It's the only time I can remember that happening. It just wasn't a part of daily life in my house. And I can't say I ever really thought about it very much. But of course, in the 1950s, the big thing that was happening in Kidwood was TV coming into one's home. And I quickly became a friend of the Mickey Mouse Club and all those Saturday morning shows that were great, and began to plan my life, and I was an only child, around the idea of the TV shows that I wanted to see. And one of my favorites back in the 50s, some of you may remember it, I won't ask you to reveal your age by saying whether you did or whether you didn't. Oh, what the heck, I'll ask for a show of hands anyway. <laughs> How many of you remember the life and legend of Wyatt Earp? <laughs> ah, okay, Hugh O'Brien. You remember Hugh O'Brien? Rock jawed, you know, very handsome. You know, and he'd, he'd approach the camera at the beginning of each show with his fancy vest and his frontline special in his holsters that was a revolver with an especially long barrel for some reason. He was great. I loved Wyatt Earp. I'd watched that show. I'd learned later that it was the first Western made for TV for adults. I didn't know that at the time. I didn't care. I liked it. I thought it was great. And Wyatt Earp on that show was, as the song said, brave, courageous, and bold. And he was perfect. He drank milk. <laughs> Sometimes coffee. And he always got the bad guys. I don't think on his show he ever actually killed anybody. He'd always just wing them or shoot the gun out of their hands or something like that. But that isn't what I like best about the show. For me, the really interesting character on that show was Dr. John H. Holliday. Remember Doc Holliday? He was a dentist, they said, but I never saw him operate. He was also a gambler, a card shark, a gunfighter, and incredibly, a drunk. He drank all the time. And he was never impaired. I mean, not didn't even know that could happen. You know, he'd, he'd have several drinks, and then he'd get in a gunfight and take down the Clanton brothers, and, you know, never missed. Oh, he was also terminally ill. He had tuberculosis. And so all of this mixed together made him a fascinating character for a 10-year-old. So, wow, look at that guy. Here was a man with nothing to lose and who was living life to its fullest. And so when my friends and I would get together and we would play cowboy, which we love to do, cap guns were big in those days, I always chose to be Doc Holliday. And we would set up a bar, stock it with Coca-Cola, 
And you picture this, if you will, a 10 or 11 year old kid sauntering across the playroom floor up to the makeshift bar and saying, whiskey. <laughs> and my friend Johnny would take a little glass. We had to use his sister's little pink doll cups because we didn't have shot glasses, but you know, it didn't matter. And pour me a shot of Coke. Give me another. And I'd have three or four shots of Coke. And then I'd go out in the backyard and I'd gun down the Clanton boys. That was probably the way I pictured alcohol in my life. Something that could enhance your life, a lifestyle that might be emulated, and could somehow make you a better, more respected person. Certainly, Doc Holliday never appeared drunk. And so I didn't have an, any idea that that was what alcohol would ultimately do. And I didn't have for a long time the opportunity to find out because there was a, over my teenage years, there was a cloud of moral disapproval about drinking alcohol and it wasn't readily available. And I was a good kid and most of my friends were good kids. And so we didn't do that. But then I got to college. Now college was a dry campus, but there was alcohol available. And the fraternity parties that were held off campus were certainly filled with alcohol. At the beginning of it all, I was determined not to drink. I had already felt a call to ministry, and it seemed to me that somehow being a pastor and being someone who drinks didn't go together, and so I really had not much interest in it anymore. Doc Holliday was long gone. And so one night, I guess in my junior year, yeah, I got that far. <coughs> my friends and I, my two fraternity brothers, my roommate and another very close friend, decided that we would conduct an experiment. We had a psychology class or something that we thought might be relevant. And so we determined that we were going to choose a night that we would give over entirely to drinking. In other words, we set out to get as drunk as we could, as fast as we could, just to see what it was like. And for the sake of science, we decided that we would set up a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder and record the whole thing as well as keep a written log of how much we were drinking and how often, and then later on we would study it closely and see what effects this was having on us. I don't remember much about that night. I do remember one of my last memory of, of the evening was sitting on the floor and wondering how my glass had gotten on its side. And which was a very silly thing to do because it spilled the drink on the carpet. Well, there was only one thing to do, of course, and that was to refill it. And I remember very clearly looking across the room to the desk where the bottle of Seagram 7 was standing. It was about half empty at that point. And determined to get across the room to get another drink. But there was a problem. I knew there was only one bottle there, but I could clearly see five of them. <laughs> I could read the label on each one of them. And this worried me because how was I to know which one was the real one should I be able to get over there? That's the last remembrance that I have of the evening. The next thing I remember, I wake up naked in my bed under a sheet. The sheets are soaked with perspiration. There's no one else in the room. There's only one light on and it has a towel over it, over the shade. And around the room, and this was my, my bedroom in the fraternity house, there were piles of 
wet towels in different places, which had been used to clean up the barf. I had no idea how I got there. I didn't remember anything that happened after I counted those five whiskey bottles. And I didn't know where everyone had gone. I ascertained that it was 4.30 in the morning. The house was quiet. And I realized that something incredible must have happened that got me into that situation. And I reflected on it. And I thought, wow, what a great evening. <laughs> Man, that was terrific. And later on, I learned the details and listened to the tape recording, which quickly became very unintelligible. And of course, the log of how much we were drinking eventually became illegible itself until it, until it was just a series of scribbles. So I don't really know in detail how all of that happened. I was told I was thrown in the shower to try to sober me up. It didn't work. But I also determined that while this was a very strange event, it certainly wasn't a harmful event, and it might be something I'd like to try again sometime. Doc Holliday, you see, was still alive. But Doc Holliday was being replaced by someone else in popular culture, James Bond. Bond, James Bond. Shaken, not stirred. And so I became acquainted with cocktails because it was sophisticated. It was daring. It made you sexy and attractive and bold. Indeed, after I met my first wife in seminary, my wife's name was Elisabeth, she was from Germany, drinking was entering into my life as a more or less regular basis. At my seminary, there was a pub around the corner and down the street called Jimmy's Tap. I'm looking over there because there's a, sem a, a former seminarian sitting over there who's also familiar with Jimmy's. Great place, wasn't it, Chris? Uh, by then, I had also acquired a taste for beer, and so Jimmy's was a nice place to go in the evenings. Of course, I was busy falling in love with Elizabeth. She was a native German, and so alcohol was already a part of her native culture in a way that it was not part of mine. And it didn't occur to her that there could be any kind of objection to going to Jimmy's and having a beer from time to time. The experience that I was having up to that point, you see, was being shaped by that drunk night in the fraternity where, in my mind, I had established the doctrine of control. You see, I could get so drunk that I couldn't remember what happened, but somehow I was still in control because there was really no lasting effect. And it was something I had done intentionally. So after we were married, we continued to enjoy going out and having a beer from time to time. And then gradually, cocktails at home, getting home late in the afternoon, having a drink before dinner, and then after a while having a drink before bedtime. And it just became a regular part of life. I began to feel a little uneasy about it because there were certainly social implications in this for a parish pastor. And while it was certainly acceptable to go to a wedding reception and have a glass of champagne and maybe even a cocktail before dinner if it was that kind of a reception, certainly I didn't want to run into too many parishioners at the local liquor store too frequently. And so I mapped out an area where I lived where I could identify any number of liquor stores. In Pennsylvania, we called them state stores. Isn't it interesting how different states have different names for these places that sell booze? 
You know, there's, there's state stores. What is it in Virginia? Anybody from Virginia? ABC stores? Or something? I haven't figured that one out. In Massachusetts, it's package stores. Like, I'm going to go get a package. <laughs> we never call them liquor stores, except maybe in Illinois. I always liked Illinois. Illinois has liquor stores. You know, you go there, you do what you were there for, and everybody else knew it too. In any case, I had, this, I had this map in my head of all the liquor stores so I could set up a rotation. And I could go two or three times a week to restock, always to a different store. So that if I did run into somebody, it would, couldn't have been more than once every two weeks or so. Still, every now and then, you would run into somebody who knew you and what you were, and they might say something like, I didn't know pastors drank. And that was the beginning of the self-justifying lies. Lies. And I had a really good response. I didn't know pastors drank. Well, you know what to say to that, don't you? Jesus turned water into wine. Oh, that's right. Well, it must be okay then. So alcohol became a regular part of my life, as long with a sense of self-deception that went with it. Because it never was a problem, really. I liked Doc Holliday or James Bond. I was never impaired. And then after about 10 years of marriage, my wife Elizabeth was diagnosed with breast cancer. She battled that disease for 24 years, getting increasingly ill each time it recurred. And it was then that alcohol became, for me, necessary. In order to help her, I felt I needed to dull the fear and the pain that I was feeling, because I was very, very afraid with four young children what was going to happen if she would die. So I began to drink a bit more regularly. Maybe a couple of drinks before dinner, a couple of drinks in the evening, maybe even at noontime if I was able to get out of the office and come home. And so that became the pattern. And over those 24 years, the rate of my drinking increased, but I was always, you understand, in control. It wasn't a problem. I began to realize my family was concerned, and there were attempts by my growing children and by my wife, Elizabeth, to bring it to my attention. But of course, they were wrong. What they were seeing wasn't what they thought they were seeing. I was fine. Even when I began hiding bottles in different places around the house, including in the file cabinet in my study, I was sure that nobody knew that I was doing this, except for the one evening when my son said to me, why do you keep going into the study and coming back out, Dad? Is that where you're hiding your liquor now? Because I wanted to be supportive of my very sick wife, I tried to cut back on the drinking. I went to AA, which made absolutely no sense to me at all. I didn't know what those people were talking about. I kept going, thinking that just by going to AA, I was somehow going to magically stop drinking. Didn't happen. I went to see a psychiatrist. He listened to me a lot, but he never suggested that I was drinking too much. And so I figured, well, he doesn't think it's a problem. One time, I was stopped by the police when I was driving. I hadn't been drinking a lot that day. I had had only maybe four or five vodka and tonics. And I was sure that I was cooked. This was it. And there was a odd kind of release that went with that feeling because I thought, I'm finally caught. Now maybe something's going to happen. 
But you know what happened? The police gave me a breathalyzer test. They gave me the, the thing where you're supposed to walk a straight line. Which, of course, I failed. Then they had a private conference between the two of them. This was in my own neighborhood, so I'm not sure if they knew that I was pastor of the largest congregation in town or not at that point. But you know what? They said, you know, you're too impaired to drive. We're going to take you home. And they put me in the back of the patrol car, and they took me home. And I came back the next day to pick up my car. That's the closest I ever came to a DUI. Didn't get one. So, you know what? I guess I didn't have a problem. Now, I will say, looking back on it, that they may or may not have known that I was a pastor in the community, and they may have decided to cut me some kind of slack which in retrospect had been a mistake, I think. But I also know, in the intervening years, that if I wasn't a middle-aged, distinguished-looking white guy, I would have been in jail before you could spin your tires to get out of there. I was still functioning, you see. Told I was doing well. People liked me. So I must be doing everything right. Then Elizabeth died. That was back in 2006. During a terminal stage of her acute cancer, I think I did drink less because there was so much responsibility, so much to do. But after she was gone, and my grown children were then out of the house, I had nothing to do but drink, and I did. There were other attempts at interventions by some friends, some close friends who sat down with me and asked, asked me if I had a drinking problem. And of course I don't, I didn't. The fact that I was waking up at 3 o'clock in the morning and needing a drink certainly wasn't a problem. It was just something that helped me sleep. And isn't this part of the grieving process after all? And then I reconnected with a friend named Sharon, who I had known for several years, a pastor, single, and we fell in love. And improbably and inexplicably, we married a year later. And I was still drinking. And now I was happy, incredibly blessed to have another relationship. And so I celebrated and drank even more. And then I was elected bishop in the middle of all that. So you see, it must have been all right. I must have been very competent and very much in control. But I soon realized that there was more responsibility that I could handle. And when it came to signing official documents, my hands were shaking so much that my signature was entirely illegible. People were concerned. And eventually, my staff and a few members of Synod Council, God bless them, engineered an intervention. They called me into a meeting that I didn't know was scheduled. We sat around a table, and each one of them, clearly they had planned this, each one of them recited to me instances where they saw me drunk. And then one of them said, Bishop, we want you to do this job, and we want you to do it well, and you can't do it if you're not well, and you're not. You have to get into treatment. And you know, it was almost like that DUI that didn't happen. The feeling that I had was, great, just tell me what to do, I'll do it. And by the beginning of the next week, third week in Advent, 2007, I was in a residential treatment program, 
I'll tell you where it was. It was Marworth, near Scranton, Pennsylvania. And I was there for 28 days. Before I went, knowing that the arrangements had been made, I wrote a letter that was sent to all the pastors and all the congregations in the Lower Susquehanna Synod. And I told them that I, it had become clear to me that I was suffering from the disease of alcoholism and I was going to get treatment. I asked for their prayers. I asked for their forgiveness. But I also suggested that forgiveness at that point would be premature because I hadn't experienced treatment yet. To be sure, there were a number of pastors who thought I should resign the office. I didn't feel that way because I wanted to see what God had in store at this point because I did believe that I had been called to that office and so there must be something there that is going to sustain me. Well, treatment, if you have ever been in it, is like, like a cross between the military and jail. And in the course of the treatment, I realized that there were people there from all walks of life. Marworth, it turns out, is a rather effective and, and favored facility. And there were people there, when I was there, that were I to tell you their names, you would recognize them. But working together, all of us, from all walks of life, on understanding our disease and understanding what we needed to do to confront it and perhaps learn to conquer it or live with it, people were having trouble once they found out that I was a bishop. Having trouble because it focused for the others, many of them, and they told me this, that they were spiritually bereft, and they said to me, well, this ought to be a piece of cake for you, especially when it got to steps two and three, because, you know, you're, you, got that, you got that made. Well, I didn't. And I realized that when we got to steps two and three, that I was in deep trouble. And it got focused and crystallized for me by another inmate. We called ourselves inmates because the staff hated it. <laughs> Another inmate said to me, he turned out to be a neurosurgeon who was cross-addicted to alcohol and oxycontin, and an atheist. He said to me, I have to ask you a question. You have risen to a position of high authority and respect in your church. How is it that your spirituality did not prevent your addiction. Now clergy, those of you who are clergy, think about that. That was the problem, that was the question I was asking myself and I didn't know the answer. And it was only through conversation and prayer at a dark ceiling that I came to realize that somewhere along the line I had become a religious professional and was going through the motions, essentially. Leading worship, but not worshiping. Leading prayer, but not praying. And when I did pray in my private hours, in my study and in the chapel, I would pray for other people. I had a whole list but I never prayed for myself. And it wasn't until I came to realize that praying for myself was the way I would have to start every prayer that I began to understand how much spirituality I had lost. Well, treatment went well. I came out sober. And now I had to confront what to do as bishop. That question of communion came up. We talked about it a little bit last evening, those of you who were at the worship service. What am I going to do with the wine? 
You know, a lot of times the liturgy calls for the bishop to, con to con commune himself first, right in front of all the worshipers. And I decided that I was finished with taking the wine at communion. And so since that time, I've received communion in one kind, bread only. And while I appreciate the effort by congregations and others to provide non-alcoholic alternatives, it seems to me, to me, that if I cannot take the sacramental wine as part of the experience of redemption, why should I be satisfied with a substitute? And so I simply take the bread, no matter what else is offered. And it works for me spiritually because it reminds me not only of the gift of redemption that I am receiving, but of how broken I am and how much I still need that redemption. Five years into recovery, 2012, my wife Sharon, who stood by me incredibly in all of this. We had been married for three months when I went into rehab. She stuck with it, she supported me, she was a rock. And she continued to encourage me and in fact loved me unconditionally. In 2012 she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. On October 22, 2016, after experiencing a massive stroke, Sharon died. And I was pretty sure my life was over. By then I hadn't had a drink for years. And a little bit to my amazement, I didn't want one then. I didn't even consider it, nor have I done it. See, it was no longer a part of what I needed in life. But now, everything else that I felt I needed in life was gone. And so, for a year or so, I flirted pretty carefully with suicide. I was retired by then, didn't have anything to do except sit around and make plans. And I had four different plans, one of them in writing, about how I could do this. I convinced myself that it would be good for everybody if I did. And then finally I was confronted yet again by another pastor who said, you have to get into therapy. And I thought, eh, well, if that's what she wants, why not? And so I did, and it was one of the best things I ever have done. I got on medication, an antidepressant hooked up with a psychiatrist who monitors the meds, and I've been seeing a most excellent therapist weekly now for almost two years. And I feel whole again. Not happy necessarily, but whole. And perhaps it's because that in the course of discovering and facing my own brokenness, in the context of recovering a faith that I thought I had lost, I can face and even accept the brokenness of relationships, the brokenness of the world, daily finding strength in my higher power, who I now realize was there all along, just waiting like the prodigal's father for me to come home. That's all I got. <laughs>